Well, uh, this won't come as a surprise to you, but tell us about the report and the claims that the reef is in a recovery window after a decade of disturbance. Yes, I love the phrase a recovery window. This, uh, this is data that's been accumulated over a, a little while now, and uh, it shows actually, they don't, they don't actually show a graph showing this, but it's actually at record high coral cover. We've got more coral on the Great Barrier Reef now than we did when records began in 1985. We've got... Uh, twice as much coral as we had after huge cyclones went through the reef in about 2011 and 12. And this record high coral cover is despite supposedly having three catastrophic, unprecedented bleaching events in just the last five years. So you just got to wonder, were those bleaching events uh, maybe as catastrophic as, um, as these experts supposedly claimed? And has there been just a little bit of exaggeration over the last actually 50 years because these claims of the death of the Great Barrier Reef, you can read newspaper articles going back to the 1960s and 70s saying the reef is dying from crown of thorn starfish or whatever. Well, Peter, here's your graph. We'll put it up of the record high coral growth since uh, 1985. So I'll put that up. Um, but do you think they're kind of a little bit reluctant to tell us the good news reading that report or, do, or are they kind of astonished? What do you think it is? Well, yeah, they're certainly a bit reluctant. I mean, it's excellent data, and Ames need to be congratulated for doing this work over the last 35 years. But they make an excuse, you see. They say, oh, we're yes, we are at record... Well, they don't actually say record high coral cover, but we are. Um, but it's only because the fast-growing corals, the plate and the, st uh, the staghorn corals, have got going, and this is why we're at this uh, high state. But, of course, when we were at our record low in the 2012, they forgot to say, well, actually, it's just the fast-growing corals that get <laughs> killed by cyclones, and they're also the ones that bleach, and they're the ones that get hit by crown and thorn starfish. So when we got the record lows, they were saying, oh, well, if we go on at this rate, there'll be no coral left by 2025 or whatever date they, they pulled out. So there's a degree of inconsistency, and it's yet another example where environmental science organisations have just been exaggerating and being alarmist is sort of a bit of a resonance with the previous segment. Uh, this seems to be a very common theme amongst the so-called expert organisations. Can you really rely on them? It's a very great shame, but in the case of environmental organisations, generally, I don't think you can. Rita? Well, you've been vindicated. Hallelujah. Um, and I'm seeing all those in, uh, international outlets, New York, po uh, New York Post, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, who were covering the decline of the reef are suddenly not covering this latest data that's come out. But I want to ask you about this plan of transplanting coral at the Great Barrier Reef to uh, help it grow. Take us through that strategy. Why are they doing that? Is it effective? Yeah, it, this is one of many examples where you sort of get the impression that maybe the scientists are starting to lose sense of reality, actually. <laughs> that, that, that they're actually starting. planting corals. <laughs> they're planting corals on the, on the reef, supposedly to save it from climate change and all the rest. Of it. But look, the reef is the size of Victoria. It's bigger than Germany. And there's no way you go... If the reef is going <laughs> to die, it's going to die. You're not going to just be able to plant an, an area that size. And, of course, it ignores the fact there are literally trillions of floating larvae that get produced every year. And, you know, I, I used to do a lot of work on the reef, putting instrumentation, you know, instruments and various things out on the reef. And you found if you leave something out for more than a year or two, it just starts growing coral. You can't stop it growing <laughs> coral. And they're kidding themselves, <laughs> thinking they're going to transplant the reef. It just really... You really do worry about the, um, whether anybody's actually hauling them into line and saying, is this practical? Does this make any sense whatsoever? And well, there are I many love... other examples of that. <laughs> well, I love the one I was going to say, Peter, I love the one you talked about instruments, but instruments of a different kind. Uh, apparently, they're playing music under the water to make the healthy to the sounds of a healthy reef. So it's not music, but it's the sounds of a healthy <laughs> reef underwater kind of stuff to make the fish think that the reef is healthier than it is or something. I mean, these people are crackers, aren't they? Well, <laughs> well, they're, they're certainly playing sounds, and the idea is that these corals they've planted, they want to be able to attract uh, fish that are swimming around the reef. And remember, a reef is about a kilometre or three in size, and the water's around it. There's all these little fish that home in on the reef on the sounds, and supposedly they're going to 
I mean, you can just imagine it. This reef is going to have to be wired up with thousands of speakers to attract <laughs> these poor little swimming fish. And, and these sw fish are going to hear this sound and they're going to swim towards this reef. And what are they going to find? Not a healthy reef. They're going to find a speaker. You've got to wonder whether the RSPCA... Uh, but the... Has the RSPCA been told about it? Is this ethical? <laughs> no. James... Quickly before I mean, we wrap. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, what what are they going to be playing for them? Is it Jimmy Buffett? Is it going to be a bit of party <laughs> music? They're going to say, "Come on down, have a margarita." And won't those speakers in two years get covered up by coral and stop working anyway? <laughs> well, precisely. It has not music. They make the sound of shrimps and various other things that recent noisy places. But you're right. The, these coral, these speakers, and all this equipment will look like a lump of coral in about probably three to four years. You won't even be able to see the speaker. There'll be so much biological growth on it. Peter Ridd, always great to chat to you. And as Rita pointed out, you have been thoroughly vindicated by this latest report. If only the world's media would pick up on it and congratulate you on your work and also recognise the reality of the healthiness of the Great Barrier Reef. Peter Ridd, thanks so much for coming on Outsiders. Thank you.